forward. Let's open with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to live the faith that you have given us. Uh, what a what grace you have shown us that you have given us this faith. Help us to to uh, demonstrate our faith through uh, fruits of faith that our lives might be filled with with love for you and for our neighbor. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I like how the author of the textbook describes the book of James. Uh, I think it's the author that I read or the author of this textbook that talks about kind of a shotgun approach that he's kind of uh, firing off different thoughts. It, there's doesn't seem to be a, a connection between all of them, at least that it, it ties together like a normal letter. Um, he's just kind of giving you different topics of Christian living. Some of them we'll see, I think, connect, um, but it's hard to, to logically put them all together since he doesn't transition between the two that often. First of all, authorship of the book uh, and James' purpose of writing, which James wrote the letter. You have, uh, I've, I've always heard four options, not James uh, the Greater, because I believe he was uh, murdered, was it? Was he in the cheese producing industry? I don't, I don't know what you're uh, speaking of. James the Greater? No. Oh, okay. I, <laughs> Being a Wisconsin person, I thought you would have gotten that. No, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Grating cheese? Oh, I got, okay. Yeah. It's no fun if you have to explain it. It's a, I'm sorry. I'm a little slow with those. Those, uh, Not James, the lesser disciple. We really don't know anything about him. We do know that James, the half-brother of Jesus, was um, seemingly uh, had a, a position of authority in the church. And we're not exactly sure, but many believe that it's James, the half-brother of Jesus. Anything else that, that you gathered about the authorship? Well, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, earlier, of course, he didn't understand anything and uh, didn't see him as the Christ, but... Um, I like the way sometimes he's worded it uh, as referring to Jesus Christ, the Savior. Yeah. And that would really be how he knows him, because throughout Jesus' life on earth, he, he was not a disciple. So he really came to faith after the resurrection, which would be when you know Jesus Christ as for sure your Lord and and savior and if you were there uh for his ascension that would also remind you that he is he's the christ the the lord of all you gotta wonder did jesus's brothers and sisters see little miracles along the way yeah you wonder what his childhood was like did he uh did he do any of those things when he was younger i don't know I, I tend to think that he was uh, maturing, so he looked a lot like everyone else, uh, just without, without any sin. But when he was 12, he was in the um, temple, just wowing all of the, um, the rabbis and things. So that makes me think that he was an exceptional individual. Yeah, did he, did he teach in the home? Uh, and... How did, how did it get received by the, the family? Okay. Um, when and for what situation was the letter written? Let's see. I have here to shore up and, and realign Jewish Christians. They were enduring a lot of persecution and... Um, 
It was to kind of encourage them, shore them up. Yeah. Uh, hardship uh, that the Christians were facing probably included uh, not having their businesses um, frequented so they didn't have income. Um, what other hardships? Just uh, being thrown in jail, given a bad name, bad reputation, which probably was a big deal in, a, in cities that weren't as big as our cities today. So they needed encouragement for living their everyday faith, living faith on the ground, we might say, uh, living the Christian faith on the, the ground level. And why is this important to remember as you're reading the letter? I don't know. Uh, context is always important when we're reading the scripture, uh, especially when there might seemingly be contradictions. And of course, we're going to come across that in chapter two, where you have, uh, you know, the, the connection between works and justification. So it's important to remember that he's, he's, uh, he's mainly addressing Christian living here. And that, so that we'll talk about that more when we get to chapter two. And just as a, as a remem remembering too, when it comes to interpreting the scriptures, that uh, were you, do you remember being taught uh, how we interpret the scriptures as Lutherans? What are some of the key principles to remember when interpreting the scriptures? Um, you let the word interpret the word. Yeah. So the word interprets itself. Uh, let, uh, re look at the context. And then also draw in parallel passages. So if we don't understand something in one section of scripture, we look for a parallel passage that might be a little bit clearer about the topic, which is the same as letting the word interpret the word. And I always like to remind people there is not a Lutheran way of interpreting the Bible. There is one way to interpret the Bible, and that is the things we just listed. Context, parallel passages, letting scripture interpret scripture for itself one way of interpreting the Bible. There is not a, a certain denominational way to interpret the Bible. Uh, what does this remind you of at all? Um, I don't know if the, I can't remember if it was in the text or in the textbook. What does this book remind you of a little bit uh, or what part of scripture? What does James remind you of? Is yeah, what, uh, well, what other, number four there, what other part of scripture does this parallel? Oh, I would say Matthew. Yeah, uh, especially Matthew chapter five to seven, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is just uh, talking about all different topics of Christian living. And sometimes it can get confusing because it it almost sounds like works are, um are the way the ticket to heaven but remember before he even says that he says before he lists all these uh different things that a christian is doing in their life he says be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect so god's standards haven't changed but here's the fruits of of following god here's the fruits of faith the other the other uh genre of the bible that's been suggested that it's kind of similar to is proverbs Proverbs often sets up, you can go this way, or you can go this way. There's, you come to a fork in the road often in life, and you have to choose which way are you going to live? How are you going to conduct yourself? And you have two choices. And uh, so James is compared to Proverbs sometimes. The theme of the letter, very simply, I just have holy living. Um, an encouragement to holy living. And then you get to that uh, list below one obstacle to the faith from each chapter. There's uh, a few in each chapter. But what do you see in chapter one there? I have trials in chapter one. 
Yeah. Uh, persevering through the trials. Um, Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Um, and when trials come, we can often confuse them with what? In verses 13 to, and following. We, what, what's the question again? Uh, we can confuse... It can be hard to decipher, maybe is a better way of saying it. It can be hard to decipher when you're in the middle of something uh, difficult in life, whether it's a temptation or whether it's a trial, um, when you're in the middle of it. It, uh, it can be hard to decipher. And so James, in these first, uh, I would say, 15 verses, he sets up the difference between trials and temptations. Trials are, are for our good. They're to draw us closer to God. And temptations are always to draw us away from God. But when, the, when we're in the middle of it, it's sometimes hard to tell what's going on. Yeah, that's for sure. <clears throat> the... I think verses 13 and 14 are fascinating on temptation because it almost gives us a little, a little chart on what sin looks like or, or uh, it really breaks it down for us. Here's what happens with sin. Um, verse 13, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when his own evil desire by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Um, interesting to me how I've started to see more as I, as I teach the commandments in catechism class every year. I've always taught that everything comes back to the first commandment. Every sin is a break breaking of the first commandment you are not putting god above all things but uh where does it really start i wonder if god gave us the last commandments because that's really where it all starts wrong desires and when those wrong desires are allowed to um stir and and dwell and they give birth to something bigger then they show in their actions and then when they when they're allowed to continue to fester, it turns into continual perpetual sin and it snowballs out of control until it leads to death. Um, so it's almost like you start with the ninth and 10th commandment. Every sin starts with a wrong desire and it, it kind of meanders its way all through the other eight commandments until you finally get to the first commandment. And then You've turned, and then you you could turn away from God altogether. You've made something else your God. We we don't talk a lot about our um, desires, but that's another thing that um, is broken in this world. the The things we desire and the things we want, um, the things that we we are um, we are going after in this world are it's often broken we're off that's part of our brokenness too yeah I'm seeking love and seeking happiness fulfillment in all the wrong places yeah and in, in my line of work we um, we deal with a lot of the outcome of that mm -hmm. um, abortion to do we either con conceal it hide it or to um, try to do um, a quick and easy way out, which of course proves to be very wrong. Yeah. Um, so the desire is to make things easier, uh, keep my life as it is. Um, how else would you describe it? The desire that starts there. To provide enjoyment or perceived security 
love. Okay. Yeah. We're all I think hungering for love. And in these days, it's so many cases of people looking in the wrong place for love. Okay. And so when those desires are broken and, and the wantonness is in the wrong place, then, um, then it leads to all sorts of other sins. You think of David. It started with a wrong desire, a wrong, a broken wantonness, and then one sin bumped, you know, almost one pastor described it like the Plinko game in uh, The Price is Right. You just start, it just starts going everywhere. You know, the sin uh, starts, he just hits almost every commandment on the way down um, to finally getting to the point where he's unrepentant. Um, until Nathan comes to him. That would have been such a dramatic scene to watch that discussion, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, probably one of the, you know, of course the crucifixion would be dramatic, but probably another one of those scenes in the Bible that would be right up there. Pretty amazing. That along with the Red Sea. Oh, yeah. Um, let's see, verse 16, don't be deceived, my brothers, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So he just got done talking about wrong desires. But now what's going to produce the right desires in us? What's going to give birth? He just talked about how sin is conceived and gives birth and then it fully grown into and it can snowball into death. Now he's talking about something that will give us new life, new birth. That's going to produce good things in us. And that is he gives us birth through the word of truth. That we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Uh, first fruits were those things that were set aside to be given to God. We are set aside uh, for God's glory to to have new desires and new wants and uh, things that are pleasing to Him. But. Verse 18 about giving us birth. There's three, no, four times in the Bible where it talks about giving birth, us being born again. Um, I finally just tried to, I tried to figure out all the different places where that is. It's uh, John 3, where Jesus says it to Nicodemus. Titus, where he talks about the washing of water and rebirth in baptism. First uh, Peter talks about it as well. And it's chapter one, I think. Uh, can't find it do, off. Do you have a topical Bible? Uh, I have the, the Lutheran Study Bible concordance. Well, I have one that's, you can look up words and see how many times and where scripture addresses that. <clears throat> First Peter one verses 23 to 25. So you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed. This is my topical Bible. Oh yeah. I do have one of those on my shelf. I, I rarely use it though. I, I use the computer program that I have. Yeah. <laughs> this was a little before that. And yeah, um, when I went to get my master's, I used this a lot. My grandfather had one, and I think he bought it right before he passed away. And he gave it to me, but I had to, I was the first class that had to get laptops at the seminary. So we were, we were spared having to look up any more uh, dictionary definitions. Well, I don't then, see anything that says giving birth. Uh, it just talks in First Peter about 
you have been uh, given a new birth into a living um, you have been born again not of perishable seed but of imperishable and then James would be the last last one where it talks about he gave us birth through the word of truth Uh, very, very uplifting sermon at the opening service for LPS. Uh, the preacher talked about how just one of the, the beautiful things about their school is just that it's grounded on the truth and how that is so, so um, maligned in our world today. And just to build on that foundation for young people and how important that is for them. So it was a, a nice reminder of why we were there, um, building on the truth. Um, verses 19 through 27 there at the end of the chapter is one more section. Uh, there the, the topic is listening and doing. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Um, so it's it's about self control. Out with the bad, in with the good. Yeah. And and it kind of connects to that idea of bad desires and good desires produced in us by the, born in us by God's word. I like verse 26, just to talk about, uh, you know, there's a lot of bad talk today about religion. You know, people say, uh, I don't want religion, I want relationships, you know, the, and I think, I here, here James says that religion is good, and here's what is good religion. It's when faith is lived out, uh, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So God doesn't dismiss religion. I think what people are trying to dismiss when they talk about dismissing religion, uh, they want to be spiritual but not religious. I think what they're trying to dismiss is the legalistic religion. Uh, I think that I think what they're looking for is a proper division of law and gospel is, is really what they're, they're looking for and, and they're missing it. They don't, they, they miss that the Bible is this beautiful division of, or not division, but it's this beautiful uh, formula of law and gospel that convicts us and then points us to our savior. And that's what true religion is. So whenever you hear people say uh, relationships, not religion, or spirituality, not religion, I'm spiritual but not religious, um, James 1.26 is a reminder that religion is a good thing, and God's religion is um, the, the law that convicts us but sends us to our Savior at the same time. Do you find that people that say that just use that as an excuse that they want to do their own thing? Yeah, they've become Bibles to themselves, uh, yeah. is the way one professor always put it. Uh, we live in a world where people want to, to become their own scripture. I think I'm going to talk about that a little bit this Sunday, because uh, we're looking at Mark 7, where, the, where Jesus... Uh, pretty sharply rebukes the Pharisees for their hollowness of faith and going through the motions of faith. Um, it, what they're really doing in creating man in creating all these man-made customs is they're lowering God's standards. 
to something that they can do, that they, they couldn't accomplish all of God's laws. They couldn't do it perfectly, so they lower God's standards. And in a sense, I think that's what many people are doing with the spiritual but not religious. I have my set of standards here, and as long as I do pretty well at keeping them, I should be good. At least I can feel good about myself, even though deep down they may know it's not good enough. Yeah, being the, that he commands us to be set apart from the world, there are standards we need to meet as a Christian, if, if that's what we're going to call ourselves. And this kind of does an end run, run around that, I, I think. It does or it doesn't? It does. Yeah. So we get to chapter two. What did you pick out as an obstacle to true faith in chapter two? I have favoritism. Yeah. Partiality. Yeah, this hits home because we came out of an environment where there was a lot of favoritism from the top down. And um, it was really sad to see that. In the sense of uh, activity in the in in church life or yeah and and uh, socializing oh, okay uh, largely too um there were there was the a list and the b list mm. and even <laughs> even my son who came home from being out of state picked up on it right away oh yeah so i i was hoping it was my imagination but yeah yeah you want to put the best construction on things and then yeah. sometimes it's confirmed but uh in this section too it's the reminder of i think a theme through here and it's going to come up in chapter four you know god opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble the to humble ourselves um and God is always using the, the lowly and the small to do something great. You think of Mary and her song, probably one of the greatest hymns or songs in the Bible, the Magnificat, is really, that's the theme of it. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I really think that's a theme of James. So, so don't show partiality because um, God, God uses all people in his church. Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Verse nine is where it gets really pointed. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. I always use a verse 10 in my BIC courses for new members to um, remind people that no matter how good you think your life is, if you have just that one little crack in the windshield, in the, the pebble of that, uh, cracks your windshield it may be fine for a while until you drive up north and your window freezes and then suddenly your window is not worth anything the whole thing is shattered uh, because of one little crack in the window that seemingly was harmless So don't show partiality and then chapter two, verses 14 and following. Being a Christian, uh, you, you, good works are going to flow. They are going to be fruits of faith that are going to be uh, evident or seen. We can't see faith. You can't see faith itself, but you can see the fruits of faith 
course, the verse that trips a lot of people up is verse 24. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. I think maybe that's why Luther wasn't a big fan of James. I, I just wonder if it comes down to that verse. Yeah. Yeah, he, well, I think the author of our textbook says that, you know, Luther didn't do any favors to help matters by re referring to it as an epistle of straw. Yeah. I, surely if you try to build your, your theology on a theology of work righteousness, it is a, a theology of straw. And uh, he probably struggled with how to, uh, if you are to give in and say, well, maybe it is by works, um, then you, you've essentially, you've thrown out a lot of, of what Jesus' teachings were as well, um, which is what some, some Lutherans have done with this book and concede that, well, maybe the Catholics are right. There's some works connected with our faith that um, will justify us. But it has nothing to do with justification. It has to do with, um, since we can't see faith, Fruits of faith are what are going to uh, be the things we see. Interesting, too, that in Romans 2, verse 13, Paul does make a very similar statement. He says, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Almost, almost a, an exact uh, statement there. Not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. But so in is, other words, it, oh, go ahead. It is Paul's persistent and emphatic statements that we are, are saved and justified by grace alone that counters this, we really don't have that benefit in the book of James to really balance it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what causes heartburn the most perhaps. Yeah. And, and Paul couldn't be any clearer in the rest of Romans. That's right. Uh, and you no question where you stand. Exactly. So um, we don't need to wonder or, or worry. Uh, is James teaching a different theology here? It's the context. He's talking about faith, faith lived out. Uh, faith is going to produce fruits of faith. Interesting example to me, a uh, fascinating example in verse 25, in the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies. So it wasn't her lodging the spies that, um, that ultimately she was a hero of faith or that she went to heaven. It was this, this showed her faith that she was willing to go that far to, um, to lodge the spies and send them off in a different direction. Then we get to chapter three. Uh, what's the obstacle to true faith in chapter three or, or what's one of them? I have the tongue. Yeah. This is a, a chapter where you, uh, that's so applicable because we all, we all have uh, those times where we wish we could take something back that we've said. Um, we are all guilty. Yeah. yeah. And we've all seen in our life how it is like the small spark of fire in the forest and it sets everything ablaze. You know, just one small um, misspeak, misspeaking of something and it can set everything, uh, it can create a forest fire. Um, So many good illustrations in this uh, in this section too.
the the rudder, this very small rudder, wherever the takes the pilot wherever he wants to go in a ship. Um, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Uh, it's like the small spark. Um, it's like the, the wild animals of the earth that it cannot be tamed. Fresh water and salt water cannot flow from the same spring. Um, the, the fig tree analogy. I wish I wish the uh, illustrations flowed like that uh, for my sermon writing as well. But, uh, all all good illustrations there for for us. Then you have uh, the last part is about selfish ambition and every. Uh, Envy, I should say. I have not not every envy. One of what is one of the most dangerous things in the church today? I put I put this one as one of them. Um, selfish ambition and envy. I think selfish ambition, especially, is just a a fruit that we see in our society. It's all about me. Uh, worship becomes all about me. What um, do I like the hymns? Do I not like the hymns? It, how does it? How is it best for me? I, I haven't fully put together wisdom contrasted with envy. How the, I'm not exactly, I, I've never uh, been able to articulate that very well. Well, it's in quotation marks, so it's really not wisdom as we uphold wisdom. Oh, so yeah, the wisdom of the earth is filled with selfish ambition and envy. It's all about pleasing myself, whereas the wisdom that comes down from heaven is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy. Okay, so it's it's essentially talking about earthly wisdom. Yeah, and 2 Corinthians 5, where Christ's love compels us, uh, that we are convinced one died for all, that we should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us, is what it reminds me of there. That's wisdom from above which is a totally different way of living than the world, living with selfish ambition and envy. Anything else in chapter three there? Chapter four, what's the... Uh, Obstacle to Christian living? I have pride. Yeah. Scripture is very clear about that sin. Yep. So the first part, verses one and two, talk about fights and quarrels. So God wants orderliness, not disorder. He wants unity, not division. And then verse four, I guess, talks about 
being a friend of the world's, uh, I think that that was another dangerous one that I had. Uh, you adulterous people, don't you know the friendship with the world is hatred towards God? There's that proverb type idea that you can go one of two ways, uh, either be a friend of the world or be a friend of God. Which one are you going to choose? Pretty strong language. Anyone to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So you can't, you can't sit on the fence. You can't have it both ways. Uh, either you're, you're one or the other. Adulterous reminds me of the Old Testament people. Remember how God, through the prophets, especially the minor prophets, he would accuse them of uh, being unfaithful to him as, as his bride. And we do the same when we choose to follow the world. Someone has said that verse 6, that quote there, um, not only could be a theme of James, but it could be a theme of the whole Bible. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, like you said earlier, he talks a lot about pride. And uh, most are repentant and humble in heart. I have always taken great comfort in verse 7. Submit yourselves unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And that is so very true. We can save ourselves a lot of heartache and misery if we just remember that. Yes. It, it doesn't often tell us um, what the devil is thinking, you know, or what he, what happens to him when when he sees Christ in us, he has to flee. He wants to run away from that, from Christ. So, yeah, we want to be connected to Christ at all times, praying uh, when the devil is, is nearby or, or tempting. Um, resist him, and he will flee from you. He has no other choice when, when Christ is brought up. And if we entertain the demons, he's right there. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a rather fascinating verse um, and comforting, like you said. I was like verse 14 of chapter four there. I think I think when people lived more um, hand to what is it called when you lived to just get by for the day and to um, mouth. yeah this passage you know they they learned to trust in god and to trust his will for you um because you didn't know what tomorrow would, but we make so many plans and we have so many um plans for our life and hopes and dreams and uh we we, we get so we can get so upset if, if things get thrown off um, but James just says, you know, what is your life? It's a mist that appears one day and it's gone tomorrow. If the Lord, we should say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Um, it's always, always a good reminder when a Christian says that, not just as a trite saying, if God wills, um, but when they genuinely say it, that, you know, God could call me home tonight. He, it could be uh, or that something, something that we never foresaw happens that just cha totally changes the trajectory of our life. Um, but we like to have everything just so. So we humble ourselves, we submit ourselves to God. Uh, we are the creatures. He's the creator. He's the redeemer. We are the redeemed. Uh, he's the one who's gracious and compassionate and forgiving. And we are the ones who have sinned. Um, we just simply submit to his will. Chapter five. What is the obstacle to our faith? I have all wealth when it is not used according to God's will.
end of verse three there. Their, their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Hmm. The corrosion of, of the things we try to pile up in this life. It all becomes, you know, you think of someone who has uh, tons of old cars out in their backyard and doesn't do anything with them. They're valuable. Um, but over time, someone comes in uh, and says, wow, these, these cars were probably once very valuable, but now they're just all rusted out and corroded and there's not much left of them. Yeah, age has its benefits. And as you get older, you let go of that material stuff more and you have your eyes fixed on Jesus, I think a little more as you're closer to hopefully crossing that, uh, that gate. Yeah. And then the when last, you, oh, go ahead. Just say when you mentioned we may die tonight, for me, that's a like, oh, that'd be nice thought. You just never know. Uh, yeah. Things. But you know what's waiting. And it is so great that we can't even comprehend it. Yeah. I would imagine a thought like that, you know, a, an unbeliever would want to quickly perish that thought because uh, they, I don't really know what's on the other side, they might say, um, but we do. Just as Catholics dread judgment day. Yeah. Hmm. Until that time though, we kind of come back to the thing he started with, patience and suffering, patience and trials. So I, it does kind of tie together that way, that you're facing these trials, there's going to be troubles and difficulties, but you still need to live your Christian life. So he ends now uh, with patience and suffering. Well, actually he ends with prayer. Uh, if you don't know what to do, if you're, you're kind of lost as to what to do in every situation, pray. Pray earnestly. Um, don't say there's nothing that you can do or nothing that you, uh, nothing left to do. You can, you can definitely pray in every situation. You have that, uh, somewhat puzzling verse about the elders anointing with oil, probably for medicinal pur purposes, but, um, I, in one uh, Lutheran school setting where my wife was once, she came into her classroom and one of the moms was anointing all the desks with oil. Uh, she was praying, I guess, maybe I'm assuming praying as she did this for each child. Um, so I'm not sure where that came from, what background that, that person came out of. Um, but some churches still do this, you know, at actual physical use of oil um, because of this passage. And the elders laying on of the hands. It's, it's repeatedly in scripture, but it's something that a lot of the churches do not participate in. Yeah, we do that with ordination. I'm not sure. Uh, I suppose you could have some who... I guess I do I do that when I go to the bedside of someone. But a lot of times it's just because of knowing that they probably have not had any commun for some of them, they have not had any commun um, uh, communication with their family or even any um, you know connection with their family. And so I put my hand physically on their head you know, as I'm blessing them, knowing that they're about to depart this life. Um, I, I, I do that just hopefully to, to give some comfort to them. Um, we did that once as elders when the pastor returned a call and I thought it was a good 
visual demonstration to the congregation. The elders laid their hands on the pastor and more or less recommissioned him as his ministry continued in our presence. Yeah. I think there's still a, a use for it. And, um, but the, uh, the anointing with oil on those visits, I, I'm not sure exactly um, what the purpose would be if they're not medicinal anymore. Um, but. Yeah, we didn't use the oil. We just did the laying on of the hands. Mm -hmm. So oh, that's where we'll we'll stop. Uh, rather interesting ending to James. There's no uh, formal ending or signing off by James. Uh, he just says, "Remember this: whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins." Reminds you of uh, Martin Luther, some of his sermons where he just says, "And that's enough for today." Uh, and I'll pick it up next time. <laughs> uh, it just kind of cuts it off there. Yeah, I can just picture him at the table in their home where people came and went and he spent probably hours into the evening talking and teaching and mm -hmm. I could see him getting to the point, okay, I'm done. And yep. <laughs> All right, well, let's pray. Why don't you uh, close us out with prayer? Father, we thank you for this opportunity to delve into your word to get to know you better, to draw closer to you. Lord, we ask that you would bless this time. And Father, if it be your will, bring others into our midst to um, interact with and share and learn from. May there be a hungering in our congregation, a, a passion to learn more and draw closer to you. We uh, ask for your blessing as we uh, go into First Peter and we know that the Holy Spirit will be with us to guide us and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Probably for First Peter, we can do all three of them. Uh, or, I'm sorry, First and Second Peter. That's John that has three. Yeah. Um, the second one, I'm, I think, is pretty short. So we'll, we'll take both of those at the same time. Okay. All right, until uh, Sunday, God willing. Yes. Take care. All right, bye.